was being built um, and was scheduled to open in 1832. And he understood that this canal, which was being built primarily or solely for a military purpose, also had the potential for uh, commercial use. And so he began to look for an opportunity that he could exploit. He found a property uh, at what's now called Bedford Mills. Um, he started a sawmill there in 1831 and a store in 1832. He actually uh, moved from Chafee's Mills to Newboro, where he spent the rest of his life. And while he started the business at uh, Bedford Mills, he actually had a larger interest in administrative work and later uh, political office. And so he actually retired from the business at Bedford Mills and another one he had in Newbro in 1850. And you can see in the picture here, the first parliament of Ontario and the Benjamin Tet, the, the gentleman in the middle with the beard. And the, the sketch on the bottom is an 1841 sketch of the Isthmus or Newbro as it's now known and the, the little bridge across and Benjamin Tet's house was there, the, the two-story White House. Go ahead, the next, next slide, please. And so um, the other family that's important are the Chafees, and I'll mention them briefly as well. Uh, these two brothers, Samuel and Benjamin, uh, they didn't have a direct role in Bedford Mills, but indirectly they had quite an important influence. So they arrived together in Perth with their families um, in 1816. Um, but a year later, they moved to Brockville and they started a partnership together that year. And a few years later, they were asked by settlers in Crosby to, um, to set up a sawmill in, uh, in Crosby. And they found a location at, at what has now become Chafee's Lock, it, it then became Chafee's Mills. Um, Samuel Chafee was kind of the mover and shaker of the operation. He built the mills and, and enlarged them. He stayed in the community and actually married uh, Benjamin Tett's uh, first cousin, Mary Ann Poole. Um, ben Brockville, or the Brockville connection was uh, Benjamin. He never left Brockville, and I'll talk about his sons in a moment who actually had an important role at Bedford Mills. Samuel Chafee unfortunately died of malaria at Chafee's Mills in 1827. He never saw the lock that was ultimately named after him. If I could have the next slide, please. Um, so of the children of uh, Benjamin Tett, three of them had significant roles at Bedford Mills. And these were John, William, and George. Uh, George, again, was the senior. Uh, he actually um, uh, started a, a firm in, uh, in Brockville called uh, George Chafee and Brother, and then later Brothers when John joined. Um, and they had a, a thriving business in Brockville and in Portsmouth and Kingston, uh, building ships. Uh, they were forwarders, they had machine shops, they built their own steam engines. Um, but they were offered this opportunity to uh, take over the operations at Bedford, at Bedford Mills by Benjamin Ted, and they agreed to do that uh, under the starting in 1850. And during their time there, they actually uh, expanded the operations considerably. They built a, a grist mill, they built a shipbuilding and a forwarding business. Uh, they expanded uh, the, uh, the sawmill itself. Um, they actually built over 40 uh, steam vessels, barges and tugs and so forth uh, at Bedford Mills alone, if you can imagine. Um, in 1861, William and George Chafee decided uh, they had no uh, further interest in being partners with Bedford Mills or uh, about Bedford Mills. So John took uh, over the, the lease himself and he actually lived there uh, and he uh, actually married uh, Benjamin Pat Sr.'s um, eldest daughter. If I could have the, the next slide, please. So in 1872, Benjamin Tett decided that he, he wanted his two sons to run the business. And so they took over in 1872 and they, <clears throat> they remained there and continued to operate uh, the businesses, various businesses now, uh, until after uh, both their deaths, uh, Benjamin in 18, um, uh, sorry, 1915 uh, and uh, John Poole in 1928. But during the time that they were there, they, they actually saw the community move from just a sawmilling complex to a thriving uh, community, what I would call a true boom town. And if I could have the next slide, these pictures give you a little sense of the, the, the activities um, that were going on. By the turn of the century, actually, Bedford Mills had a population of 150 
with many others in the area who were employed by the Tets but living on their own, their own farms. And so you see in, this, uh, photo, in these photos, uh, a number of these industries, the, saw, the sawmill, um, which was uh, in the middle of the waterfall. And down to the right below that is the grist mill, uh, the stone building. And across the road from it was a very large grain elevator. And, um, and then at the base of the waterfall on the other side of the grist mill was a, uh, a shingle mill. Um, you could see lots of stacks of lumber sitting on the, the wharves waiting to be shipped out by, by the tugs and barges that were being built at Bedford Mills. And um, there are uh, other uh, things that were built, a, a, a church in 1907. Um, and what you don't see in these uh, pictures, in addition to a few dwelling houses that were just around the church, they were built at about the same time. But uh, you don't see a new school. It was built in 1893, and they actually had a cheese factory, which uh, started in the late 1800s. So could I have the next slide, please? Um, some of you may not be familiar with exactly where Bedford Mills is. Uh, obviously, a good part of Frontenac Park uh, has its boundary on Devil Lake, and many of you have hiked or um, come in by canoe or kayak and, and explored Devil Lake. But you're at one end, and Bedford Mills is the, the very far end, uh, the easternmost end, where it flows into the Rideau Canal system. And Catherine has got a little pin at Bedford Mills. Closer to the front neck park end, you've got the Kingsford Dam, where a number of you park uh, to get in uh, an entrance through there. And one of the, this is an earlier map, and I, I asked Catherine to highlight the, the proper spelling of Tets Mine Lake. It's properly spelled T E T T apostrophe S Mine Lake. I know that the modern maps have uh, simplified it to Tet's Mine Lake, but um, Tet members of the Tet family actually think we need to get back the old spelling. So if I could have the next slide, please. Bedford Mills was a pretty small place. Uh, it was almost uninhabitable because of the rocky soil, um, but it was very strategically placed. And there were a number of important uh, strategies uh, that, that played in Bedford Mills's favor. There was a 30-foot fall of water through that waterfall from Devil Lake into Loon Lake, and that was enough to provide lots of uh, energy to power both the grist mill and the sawmills. And of course, once you got into the Loon Lake system, you're immediately into the Rideau Canal, uh, which gave uh, the ships, the, the barges and tugs access both to down to Kingston and either across Lake Ontario to the United States or down the St. Lawrence River to Montreal and Quebec and then on to markets uh, in Europe. Or one could go north uh, from Bedford Mills to Ottawa and there were markets there as well. And another um, uh, important thing is that Benjamin Ted actually had built a wharf uh, at uh, on the Rideau Canal, very close to his home uh, in Newborough. And that wharf and warehouse uh, were maintained by members of the family for many, many years. And it became actually an important uh, landing spot for both uh, passenger steamers, as you can see here, a passenger steamer in the front, and, uh, and also commercial uh, barges and tugs. And you see a barge actually waiting to get its place to uh, unload perhaps some or load on some cargo as it headed to wherever it was going. Um, if I could have the next slide, the, the major industry that really um, intersected Bedford Mills and the Tets and Chafees with Frontenac Park was lumbering. Uh, and it was important, not only was it the largest industry at Bedford Mills, but it was also the longest lasting. It started in the 1830s with Benjamin Tett bringing logs down, uh, small numbers, but as the, as the sawmill grew, the numbers grew. Um, and eventually uh, the Chafees continued those lumbering operations. And indeed, uh, John Poole, Ted and Son, the two brothers um, also continued the sawmilling. The nature of the trees that were being cut changed over the years from the huge white square pines that were being uh, harvested mainly to be used for um, uh, mass in Royal Navy ships uh, in England. But in later years, the, the trees got smaller. They were now being cut into um, um, boards. And I'll talk about that in a minute. But lumbering was done primarily in the, in the winter. 
the men mo mainly lived uh, in shanties and there were collections of these shanties throughout Frontenac Park and other areas where the Tuts and Cheekies uh, lumbered. And they would live in those shanties. They would uh, cut the, uh, the logs by hand uh, using axes. Uh, in the earliest days, they would cut them into lengths using axes as well. Later on, you can see they had cross-cut saws. Um, and those logs were then loaded onto uh, skids to be uh, skidded out to the edge of the lake that was closest, either by oxen in the early days or by a team of horses uh, in, the, in the late 1800s. And this actually is a team of horses in Frontenac Park, uh, getting their logs ready to go to the Tet Mine. And from the edge of the lake, they would then have to be transported. And I'll just talk about that in the... Uh, in the next slide. So they're brought out in the winter to the edge of the lake and either stacked in, in, in on the ice in, in rafts, uh, waiting to be transported down the lake, or they would be uh, floated or moved onto the lake in the spring and, and made into these huge rafts. And the purpose was to get the logs as many at a time from one end of the lake to the other. Um, if they were fortunate enough that that was Devil Lake, that was the end of their trip. And from there, they went directly to the sawmill. But most of the men were employed working at lakes that were higher up than Devil Lake and flowed into it. And to get from one lake to another, they had to take these massive rafts, take them apart, send a log down one at a time through a handmade uh, timber slide. Or if they were fortunate enough, perhaps there was just a waterfall, they could send them down, as you can see in the bottom left. Um, but in any case, once they got to the lake, they were reassembled into these rafts and then moved on to the next level. And the process of moving them across the lakes was not uh, an easy one. They, they had a, a horse that was um, on a specially constructed ramp, and he would go round and round and round, which would in fact uh, tighten uh, a chain that was attached to an anchor in front of the raft, and it would gradually pull the raft head which in turn was towing these uh, the raft of logs and then the process would be repeated over and over and over again until eventually the end of the lake was reached and it was a slow process for, for devil lake alone for example the the rafts would take four to five days to get from hardwood bay uh, down to bedford mills if i can have the next slide eventually they got to the mill at Bedford Mills. And uh, as I said, the earliest, the earliest huge big white pine timbers would simply be uh, bypassing the primitive mill that they had at the time and further rafted on down to uh, eventually Quebec City and shipped uh, to England. But um, a, lot of the, a lot of the lumber was now being processed for um, sawing into you know, sawing lumber rather than uh, sending whole logs um, uh, down the Rideau Canal. So they would be fed into the sawmill. The earliest uh, sawmill had a single blade called a muley saw. Um, it cut on the up and down motion. Uh, and as you can imagine, it was a pretty slow process. The log was fed one cut at a time into that saw. Then it was pulled back, repositioned, moved across back through the saw and so forth. Uh, within a few years, those early saws were replaced by um, collections of uh, multiple saws. They were called a gang saw and they could vary in size up to 10 blades. And uh, through one single pass uh, of the blades, the, the, the log that could be cut just once into multiple pieces of lumber. And once they, uh, you may be asking where the vertical or the uh, circular saw blades were. The first one was introduced in Bedford Mills actually in, in uh, 1860, but within 10 years or so, all of those vertical saw blades had been eliminated and only the circular saws were used. Um, so once they got through the sawmill, they had to be brought uh, down to the wharves uh, uh, that were in Loon Lake down below Bedford Mills. And if I head up the next slide, um, the bottom left, you see the Tug Edmund uh, sitting uh, it, at Bedford Mills, a couple of barges in behind it and big stacks of lumber waiting to be loaded onto those barges and taken down the Rideau Canal. Um, in the earliest days, actually the logs themselves were put into specially sized rafts and keep in mind that the size of the raft was constrained by the size of the lock in the Rideau Canal. 
And the smallest lock in the system was the maximum size that any raft could be. And so they would float these rafts down to each lock in, in the Rio Canal and gradually would get to Kingston. Or in later years, you had the actual barges pulling um, sawn lumber. And from Kingston, they could go across uh, to the United States. Um, but uh, a lot of the timber in the early days uh, went to Montreal and Quebec City. And to get there, they had to go down the St. Lawrence, which is a pretty gentle ride until you get to Cornwall. And between Cornwall and Montreal, there are seven sets of rapids. This was before the days of the, of the, um, the St. Lawrence Canal. And so they had to shoot those rapids. They brought on special guides who would actually tell them where the rocks were and where the the ship or the, the raft of logs could safely go and they would get on board and they would help them through. This is a passenger ship actually uh, going through the rapids at Lachine just to give you a sense of the intensity of the rapids. And these, and these rafts, as you can see in the two pictures above the map, were huge. I mean, men lived on them. Uh, it's, they sometimes were pulled by steamers, but often they were sailed as well. And when they got to the each set of rapids, they had to take these huge rafts apart into much smaller rafts, shoot the rapids, reassemble into the large rafts, and off they'd go to eventually reach Montreal. Um, if I could uh, have the next slide, please. The next industry that played a significant role uh, in Frontenac Park were the, the various mines. There were a number of both mica and phosphate mines um, in the Frontenac Park area. Uh, the Tets actually only mined uh, mica, although they, they shipped phosphate that was produced by others using their barges. And at one time, the Tet mine actually was um, the largest mine in Ontario. It was only briefly, but it was. Uh, it was certainly the largest in the area of Frontenac Park. There were two other uh, mica mines uh, fairly close to the Tet mine within the Frontenac Park itself. Uh, the Antoine mine, the farthest one to the north, and the other, which was operated at the time by a firm called Connors and Bailey. And um, once uh, the, the mica, and I'll talk about the process of mining in a moment, but once it got to the surface, it was cleaned a bit to separate it from the rock as best it could. Then it was put in uh, uh, on teams of uh, wagons and horses and brought to Bedford Mills where they had a specialized cleaning shed. It was further cleaned into the fine sheets uh, that were desired for uh, sale in various markets. And from there, it was put in barrels and shipped off to markets wherever they might be. And um, it, it was a relatively short-lived mine, actually. It only operated uh, from 1899 to 1913. If I could have the next slide, please. Um, mica mining in those days was not uh, mining as you know it today. It was very dangerous work. Uh, the men were working uh, much of the time underground in very narrow tunnels. Uh, the mica had to be mined by first drilling holes in the rock. Then uh, the next day they would come back and fill those holes with blasting powder attached to a, a long fuse, hopefully long enough. Uh, they'd uh, blast those that would cause the tunnel to get deeper and more rock to fall loose. It could be brought up to the surface using these huge winches. You can see one on the upper right there, a winch and, a, and, a, and there's a big um, kettle that they could put the, the rock in and bring it up to the surface. Um, but there were very few uh, safety standards in place, uh, very little regulation, very little um, inspection of these operations and accidents were actually not uncommon. The prize in all this was the amber mica shown in the bottom right. This was the type of mica that was mined in the Frontenac Park area. And by the time these mines were really in full production, this type of mica was uh, very desired in the United States where it was used as an insulating agent in uh, electric motors. And if I could have the next slide, the, despite the danger of the work, uh, for many of the residents of Frontenac Park in the area, it was an important source of income. Um, both uh, employment and, uh, and uh, also other work that they could do um, on a contract basis for uh, the mines. So some of the miners lived in the, the boarding house that had been built there. Um, uh, and others um, actually 
uh, were fortunate enough to be able to travel by uh, by horse uh, into the mines from their from their farms. Uh, the next slide, please. I, I mentioned a boarding house. The the Tets actually operated a farm uh, from the very early days within the Frontenac Park. Um, it was near Hardwood Bay. Uh, it had been created by Benjamin Tett in 1845. And um, it was originally one of several farms around Devil Lake, this one being actually one of the smaller ones, but it, it was primarily used to, to grow hay and other feed for their animals. Um, and also there were some stables there. But it also was a great place for the loggers to bring their logs where they could be skidded down that blue line. Uh, that's roughly where they, we think they went. Um, down to Hardwood Bay, uh, where they would then be floated down uh, Devil Lake. There was a boarding house that was built uh, near the mine office, uh, which is off to the left there. And that boarding house actually originally was used for loggers um, as, a, as a shanty in effect, uh, but uh, later the Tets converted it for a boarding house for the miners. After the mine closed in 1919, the, the Tats really had no further use for the property. Uh, they let the lease go. Uh, and the, the, the home actually was uh, converted into a residence and was lived in for many years, as I understand it. But it eventually was abandoned. And I guess the park authorities determined it was a hazard. And it was dismantled uh, in 1973. And if I could have the next slide, please. Um, some of you may not be familiar with this story, and, uh, and, and, and thankfully this story never became a reality because there were proposals that were floated in 1883 and again in 1993, 1903 that in my view would have threatened the very existence of Frontenac Park, uh, certainly would have threatened the existence of Bedford Mills as we know it, and these were proposals to extend the Rideau Canal uh, from um, uh, through Bedford Mills into Devil Lake uh, and then um, into uh, Kingsford, uh, Birch and Desert Lakes and possibly even beyond. And they would have built um, um, locks uh, through these uh, various uh, uh, places, including Bedford Mills and the Kingsford Dam. And, um, and if, if these proposals had ever gone ahead, um, I think you can imagine this would have altered the, uh, the landscape as we know it today. You know, if I could have the next slide, these proposals actually were taken quite seriously. In fact, the map on the left is a detailed map of Bedford Mills, which was drawn in 1904. And those of you just to orient who may have driven into Bedford Mills uh, from Kingston uh, will know there's a road that actually takes you into Bedford Mills. You turn off the highway now. This road that Catherine is moving with a little red dot is, is the old road. That's not the current highway, but you came along the, the road from Kingston. You could turn right and go down the Massasauga Road uh, as we still can. Or you could carry on into Bedford Mills uh, and, and uh, into the little bridge and across the bridge and onto Westport if you wanted to. Um, most commonly, of course, people were coming by water and they would come through what's marked on the map as Mud Lake, it's now Loon Lake. There'd be a narrow channel through all of those slab wharves. And eventually you would come to the grist mill, uh, which Catherine is at there now. And the proposal was to put two locks up through the waterfall. They would have had to remove the sawmill and they would have put two locks up through the waterfall and then into Devil Lake where the, uh, the proposal would be to carry on to the other lakes. There was a second proposal actually that was uh, put forward as well to avoid the waterfall and to just follow the, uh, the shoreline but below Devil Lake for a short distance through some land and then marsh. And then there was a, a more narrow uh, entry into Devil Lake um, but also requiring two locks. And once they got to um, the head of Devil Lake, then there was another lock at the, the Kingsford Dam. It was called the Old Tet Dam because they built it to help control the flow of water for their mills. And um, there would have been a lock built there. But I, you know, the re both these proposals ultimately were rejected uh, because they were simply going to cost too much and they couldn't make the economic case to go ahead. But thank goodness they didn't. If we now we're all part of the Rideau Canal system with the heavy boat traffic and so on. I don't think 
Bedford Mills would certainly not be the same as it is today. And I don't even know the Frontenac Park uh, would exist as a, as a provincial park. And if I could have the next slide, please. You might ask, so where, where do we see the evidence of the tests and the JPs today? And the answer is, you're not going to see much. There's a few overgrown roadbeds. There's the so-called Tetsmine Lake uh, and Tetsmine Lake Loop. Uh, there is a Tet's boarding house, or at least there used to be a pile of logs. I don't know to what extent that still exists. And there are some remnants of the mica mine. There's a few evidences of, uh, of um, pit openings in the, in the steep slopes. Uh, and at the bottom of one gully, very deep ravine, is uh, an old boiler that was used to provide power for the various uh, steam power tools they had, such as drills and pumps. Um, and the winches, uh, and they were all powered by this huge big boiler. Now, the, most of the equipment and the buildings were removed in the 1920s, but I think the boiler was de determined to be too large to move it now is the proud home of uh, rack or porcupine droppings. But uh, as one walks around the various loops in uh, Frontenac Park, you can still find some pieces of mica on the trail. So the next slide, why, why did Bedford Mills uh, you know, become what I would call a ghost town? I mean, it, it really did. It had been a boom town at the turn of the century, but by 1930, uh, the community was essentially dying, if not dead. Um, and the simple answer for what happened is the resources declined. The timber became increasingly difficult to find. Uh, the demand for mica dried up as other sources, cheaper sources were found in the United States. And, um, and there was no market for using uh, tugs and barges uh, because railways were taking over the, uh, the movement of cargo. And so the various industries of Bedford Mills started to close one by one. The grist mill, um, actually the first to go was the shipbuilding and forwarding business in, uh, in 1911, but the grist mill uh, closed in 1915, and the sawmill closed in, uh, in about 1920, and it was actually dismantled in 1923. Um, the various other industries, what little there was, were gradually shuttered. The Tets, Tets tried desperately to keep the store and post office going. The store, you can see, perched up on the top of the hill there, uh, but it faced its own challenges. Uh, the people didn't like to climb the hill. Um, there was a steep climb up the hill and then another steep climb up a set of stairs to get into the store. And people simply found that they had alternatives. They could go now more freely by road to neighboring communities like Westport or, uh, or Newborough. And so the store was facing increasing competition and the Tets made the decision in the 1920s to move, to move it down to the second story of the grist mill after it closed. And you can see, uh, this is a later picture, but a set of stairs up in the second story. And, uh, and it was a true general store at that time. Now the photo on the upper right actually was taken in 1948. And that happened to be the year that um, all of the remaining uh, buildings and properties within Bedford Mills were sold uh, as a result of the, um, the sale of the estate of the J.P. Tett and Brother uh, firm. Um, the store, uh, and I should mention that the school closed in 1964. Um, the store kept going. Um, after it left the Tad Hands, um, uh, a woman named Ruby, Ruby Bosford, bought the grist mill. And she operated the um, store until the 1960s when she eventually decided to retire. And, and it's been a private residence ever since. But, Many of you may remember Ruby's store. It was a true general store. It sold gas, as you can see, pumps in the, there in an old car. Uh, she rented boats, she rented rooms upstairs to tourists, um, and, uh, and she, she sold live bait. Tourism was becoming uh, the major industry for all of the areas of the many Rio communities, and certainly Bedford Mills, and, Frontenac Park. Um, many of the residents from Frontenac Park moved away. They didn't have uh, employment like they did. Um, but many stayed and helped become part of that uh, tourist industry. And you can see that bass, fit, or bass and lake trout fishing were 
kind of the predominant uh, species to be caught in Devil Lake, and they caught some Whopper Lake trout in, in those days. And so if, if I could have the next slide, they, there's not much left to see at Bedford Mills. Uh, actually, you won't see really anything except a really tranquil paradise. Um, a few of the original buildings uh, still belong, or still are to be found at Bedford Mills. The old store, uh, the wooden store is still there at the top of the hill. Benjamin Tett Jr.'s residence is uh, still a, a private residence at Bedford Mills. The grist mill is also a private residence, um, and the uh, and the church, uh, St. Stephen's Church, is uh, is still there as well. Um, and the the church actually uh, is still operational. Um, it's open for services um, on Sundays, but only in July and August. Unfortunately, last year because of COVID. Um, services were, were never uh, open, the church was never open, but we're hopeful uh, for next year, or this year, later, sometime. There are a few residents of Bedford Mills itself, some permanent uh, and some cottagers. Um, and so if I could uh, close by just thanking you and um, uh, again thanking the friends for the invitation to speak, I, I again would like to acknowledge my daughter who's running this uh, PowerPoint presentation from Montreal, but she also helped me assemble and, uh, and clean up uh, many of these slides. Um, I had the good fortune to meet Chris Barber while he was researching uh, his book on the, on the uh, Enduring Spirit, which has been mentioned a few times during the meeting. And um, he was researching the book. He, he and I had opportunity to communicate several times about the texts and the chafees and Bedford Mills and, and and much of that material is in, in the book. Um, and to thank us, he took uh, my wife uh, and our son, Chris, who's the little blondie there on the left, and uh, Chris's then girlfriend and my wife, and off we went uh, through a hike on the park. Uh, not a, a hiker, but a physician, I must say, it was exhausting, um, but I really enjoyed it. And he even took us to the Mikeman site. And as you can see, we even get the occasional celebrity uh, visitor uh, to Bedford mm -hmm. Mills. And so if I could have the last slide, I just uh, turn it back over to Simon. I'm certainly happy to answer any questions, either through the chat or through direct questions. But uh, uh, you can also follow up with me if you're interested in anything about this uh, Bedford Mills or the history, bedfordmillsbook at gmail.com. So thank you again. Well, thank you very much indeed. Thanks. Thank you. That was absolutely a riveting presentation and uh, most informative. Uh, and uh, I think you've taught our, our participants here uh, a great deal about the, the background to that, that part of the park and um, the history. Certainly, I did not realize how, how convoluted the whole log, logging and log extraction process was. That, that's quite something. Um, we have some time for some questions, if anybody has any uh, that they'd like to bring up. They need to unmute, I don't know, or put them in the chat. Um, well, thanks. I, I just, I suppose it's a, it's a curiosity question. Um, why, why did it end up being called Devil Lake? <laughs> In the first well, place, <laughs> that's that's actually one of the chapters in my book. Um, and uh, rather than reveal the uh, the secret, I will tell oh. you it's, it's the shortest chapter in the book too. Ah. I think the shorter answer is nobody really knows, but there are some anecdotal tales. So, um, but the, some people swear they can see the devil in some of the rock formations uh, in the steep cliffs in Devil Lake. Mm -hmm. That's one of the theories. Uh, there are others who believe that the lake actually, if you look at it from an aerial view, actually looks like a devil's face. That's my theory. <laughs> it looks just like the devil. Oh, I see. I had to... Bedford Mills is the tail of the devil. I see. The town of the devil. Okay. Um, thank you. Sorry, uh, just a, another one. Um, I'm aware, of, of course, Kingsford Dam has changed the lake levels in, in Kingsford and, and Birch Lakes uh, over time. Was there any change in the level of Devil Lake 
did they dam at all at the the Bedford Mills side, or, or was it is that the natural water level? So I noticed on some of the maps, some of the islands are different sizes. So I didn't know if they changed the level. Absolutely, the water levels changed, and uh, each time the Tets uh, or the Chafees improved the sawmill, they would actually uh, improve the dam in front of the sawmill, which would then further dam up both Devil Lake and then mm -hmm. um, obviously that water backed up into other lakes. So. The area in front of our cottage, um, if you look at the old maps, was called Lock Creek. It was just a little creek flowing down to eventually the waterfall of Bedford mm -hmm. Mills. It's now a big bay of Devil Lake. Right. And a deep bay, very deep. Well, very interesting. Thanks. So that's, that's the. There is a question. A There's a question in yep. the chat. Uh, yep. Chris Bowes asking, where does the name Kingsford come from? And that's not one I know. Hmm. We, we believe that Bedford Mills was named after the Duke of Bedford, although I don't quite understand why, because the tests were from Somerset. But nevertheless, <laughs> that's the theory. But I, I, somebody must know about perhaps a king or something, but I don't know about Kingsford. Okay, another question is uh, from Janice Lay. I am located near where Crosby Mills are located on the Massasaga Creek. I believe these were operated by the Chafees and Tess as well. Do you have information on these mills as well? There are lots of artifacts still around from a very active sawmill. Yeah, and I, I know quite a bit about that sawmill. So um, it was actually owned and operated by John Chafee himself. And so while he was operating Bedford Mills, he had an equally active sawmill at, uh, at, at what he called the Crosby Mill, which is at uh, uh, Massasauga Creek where it flows into Mosquito Lake and then into the Rideau system. And those two mills operating together were turning out millions and millions of board feet of lumber every year. Um, but actually, I think there may have actually been two Crosby Mills, one at where, where the top of the creek, uh, the top of the creek where the, um, uh, the I'm sorry, my um, so I can try to pull up a map for you, Dad, if you want. Just okay. keep on talking, and I'll get you a map. Uh, at the top of the creek of right. Mass uh, Massasauga, where it enters into um, um, or leaves Buck Lake, there there was a dam there as well. And we think that the, the, there was a small, small sawmill um, at, that, at that point. Um, but then at the other end of Buck Lake, um, the, where the, it enters this creek that flows down to the Massasauga, um, it, it, uh, it was the big mill. And that's the one you're talking about. And it actually had a, a, as big a production, if not bigger than Bedford Mills with a boarding house and so on. But it only had a sawmill there. Not sure how helpful that map was. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you. Okay, and then Patrick Caricia, have you or your and your son caught any fish that approached the size of of one of the one in your photo? Well, I, I think uh, my friend Pat knows the answer to that. Um, actually, Chris has caught bigger fish than that, but they're because they're northern pike. Um, which can grow to quite a size in Devil Lake. But um, I personally have never caught a lake trout, nor has my son, Chris. Um, I, I, we have friends that certainly catch lake trout and they're nowhere near that size. So I think, um, you know, going back to our previous speaker, the lake has changed. Uh, the, the size of the fish uh, has changed. Uh, I fish every year and I must say, I, I noticed the number of fish from year to year varies too. Uh, and maybe that relates to uh, the alkalinity or acidity of our lake. Although I understand Devil Lake is actually uh, one of the fortunate ones. It's actually neutral and has a, a good base, which actually prevents it probably from becoming an acid lake. But... Okay, so there's uh, no, there doesn't seem to be any more questions or any hands up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much again, John and, and, and Kathy, for an excellent presentation. Thank and you, you guys. The, the book, um, when, when will the book be out? You, you know. 
That's the, uh, uh, the think, number one question. Yeah, okay. uh, well, <laughs> it, it, as Catherine would say, it's a, it's a moving target. Uh, we, we think actually the content is finished. Um, mm -hmm. It's turned out to be a much larger book than I ever thought it would be. And now we have the challenge of editing it, indexing it, putting all the photos, images, and what you've seen today are just a, a tip of the iceberg. We'll see in the book. And uh, I'm hoping it'll be out later this year, but we shall see. I promised the friends that I will deposit a copy with your, uh, with your office. Well, oh, yes. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Well, thank you very much again. And uh, thanks too for the insightful questions. I'm just going to share my screen now. Um, and thank, thank, thanks again, John and Kathy, and, and uh, you're welcome to stay on. And, uh, We'll be talking soon, I hope. Thanks. Um, sorry, speaking of Duke of Bedford, but we have a, uh, coming to the conclusion of our, our event today. Um, so, um, next presentation is uh, from our Student Research Award winner. Uh, Michelle Cohen. Uh, was the uh, awardee for 2021. And this is uh, a, an award that so the Friends established a few years ago in order to encourage research in the park, both into natural and human history. And um, we have a uh, request every September, generally we put out a request for, for nominations for this, this, this award and uh, have a small committee that reviews them. And then we award it to the, the most um, uh, deserving uh, recipients. And this year for 2021, it's Michelle Cohen. And she completed her Bachelor of Sciences in Biology at Queen's University and is now in her second year of a Master's of Environmental Studies under the supervision of Dr. Ryan Danby at Queen's. Uh, her passion for ecosystem conservation and management planning has drawn her to focus her studies on local environmental changes. And the subject of her presentation is changes in forest composition surrounding granite barrens in the Frontenac Arch. So thank you very much and, and uh, welcome Michelle. And you should be, I hope, be able to screen share. I think you're on mute still. So uh, yeah, there we go. Perfect. Thanks. Thank you so much for that, Simon. Yep. Uh, I'm just going to share my presentation. Okay, so can everyone hear me and see the presentation okay? Look, yes, it's looking good, thanks. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Perfect, thank you so much. So to start off my presentation, I want to thank everyone at Friends of Frontenac and all of you for giving me the opportunity to speak with you today and about my research. And so my research focuses on changes in forest composition surrounding granite barrens on the Frontenac Arch. Okay. Here we go. So a brief outline for my presentation. First, I will discuss the applications of historical ecology and the goal of my research. Then I'll introduce you all to the ecosystem type known as granite barrens. Then I'll discuss my research objectives, my methods, and I'll close with the significance of my research. Historical ecology is used to assess the changes in an ecosystem over time, and it is increasingly being used to help define reference conditions for ecosystem management. Well-known applications of historical ecology include the use of tree ring analysis to understand tree age and natural fire regimes, and the use of early photographs to monitor rates of landscape change. And so we can see each of these examples on the screen here. The left is a picture of a cross section of a tree. Um, and this is a photo I took last summer and we can see all those lovely tree rings. And on the right, we see a sample of an aerial photograph 
that was taken in the 1960s of an area in the Frontenac Arch. The goal of my research is to implement these techniques to analyze the dynamics of woody vegetation and granite barren ecosystems in the Frontenac Arch to provide reference data to support ecosystem restoration and forest management. Granite barrens are typically found on hilltops or ridgetops. And as we can see on the picture to the left, they're characterized by their sparse tree cover and areas of exposed bedrock. These areas commonly harbor rare and threatened species, including Ontario's native lizard, the five-lined skink. Fewer granite barrens means that there is less habitat available for species that depend on them, highlighting their conservation importance. Although the existence of granite barrens is owed to their thin layer of soils, it has been hypothesized that they were historically influenced by periodic fires to help maintain their open canopy. Conservation agencies have expressed concern that an absence of these fires and periodic disturbance is resulting in the encroachment of woody species or an extension of the adjacent tree canopy, which can altogether decrease granite barren size or eliminate them from the landscape altogether. And so while I was doing some of my own investigating of these granite barrens, um, I came across these charred tree stumps, which we can see a photo of on the right here. And this helps show us the history of fires and these charred tree stumps were prominent and uh, were found all around and around the perimeter of many of the granite barrens that I visited. So, Tree encroachment on granite barrens has not been thoroughly assessed in the Frontenac Arch, and it is unknown if it is a localized or regional or recent or historical phenomenon. And so this brings me to my three research objectives. The first is to assess changes in size and abundance of granite barrens within the Frontenac Arch. And this is achieved using historical aerial photographs. The second is to determine the processes involved in the observed changes within the granite barren sites by conducting site investigations like fieldwork. And finally, the third is to consider the implications of long term conservation and management of granite barren ecosystems. My research utilizes a multi-method approach to include both qualitative and quantitative data. So the first method that I'll discuss is the aerial photography analysis. I am completing an analysis of land cover change at Granite Barrens across the larger Frontenac Arch region using aerial photography. This analysis compares aerial imagery that was collected at the Frontenac Arch from the 1920s, the 1960s, and 2008. And so just by looking at the images on the screen, we can see the difference in image quality over time. And so if we look at the image on the right, the far right, 2008, um, granite barrens are the areas that are the light brown ruddy color. And if we look at the 1920s and 1960s imagery, we see that we've had to stitch together and align multiple different aerial photographs to uh, you know, create an overall picture of what this region looked like. And of course, um, it's harder to determine things like barrens and marshes and ponds in the black and white imagery but we can use the current imagery as a frame of reference to identify these features. And this comparison 
of historical and contemporary imagery is being completed using ArcGIS software, which is a geographic information system for working with maps and other geographic information. And this will allow me to quantify change of granite barrens over time, including things like changes in patch area, shape, and configuration of the barrens. Okay, and the second uh, methods that I'll method component that I'll discuss is the fieldwork and dendroecology side of things. While analyzing granite barrens through technology is great, I really needed to visit them to get a clear idea of what exactly was going on at these sites. So my research does contain quite a fieldwork component. So I have visited 10 granite barren sites at Queen's University Biological Station. And each of these sites um, I've, I've pinned, um, we can see on the picture to the left, this is a screenshot I took from Google Earth and I've pinned each site um, that I have conducted field work at. And at each of these sites, I established uh, 20 by 20 meter plots to inventory all the seedlings, saplings, trees, and shrubs within the plot. Cores and cross sections were collected so that I could establish the exact year in which each tree ring was formed. And this helps fill in some of the gaps in knowledge or puzzle pieces, as I like to think of them, to reveal the bigger ecological picture of what has been happening at these granite barren sites. Like things like composition and age of woody species, because this is information that I can't really get just by looking at aerial photos. And so many of the sites, um, many of the trees, sorry, that I sampled include white ash, red cedar, northern red oak, white oak, and I also collected a cross section of low-lying shrubs, which mainly included the common juniper. I completed a two meter wide belt transect going through the middle of the plot to identify which species of seedlings are currently persisting. And this is interesting to come back to in the future to see if there's a change in vegetation at these sites and to see you know, which of these seedlings established. And so if we look at the photo on the right, there's a photo of me and my undergraduate field assistant uh, in the field collecting and recording this data. I also surveyed the sites to look for signs of any history of fires. And I recorded an inventory of any dead charred tree stumps in and outside the plot, just like the, an example of the charred tree stump that I showed on a previous slide. And I recorded the exact location of each stump on GPS software. Collecting evidence of past fire events helps to give us an idea the extent to which fire played a historic role in the maintenance of these granite barrens. Okay, so goals for spring and summer 2021. Um, in early spring, I plan to establish additional plots in Frontenac Park and repeat those same fieldwork methods that I just described. Findings from my aerial photography analysis will be used to select these additional sites and results from my aerial analysis will serve as a means of ground validation or ground truthing of the landscape by being able to precisely indicate the dates of woody plant establishment indicated in the photos that I analyzed. This helps us understand the dynamics, the species dynamics of the barren, age of trees and mechanisms of tree and shrub establishment. And also to further understand if the results are consistent 
elsewhere in the Frontenac region, besides if I were to only focus my research on the cube's properties. Results from my research will provide reference conditions for ecosystem restoration and park management planning for the conservation of granite barrens across the Frontenac Arch. The environment is constantly changing. So to apply a management strategy for it once and hope that it is effective forever is unreasonable. The management strategy should be dynamic and work with the dynamics of the landscape. Aerial photographs provide information across broad spatial extents, but they have limitations for inferring processes. Conversely, site investigations obtain detailed information, but they have limitations across broad spatial extents because of the need to sample so many sites. By combining the two approaches, I have the opportunity to fill the gaps found in historical data with on-site investigations and vice versa. And so to close, we have this picture of me and this deer that was taken last summer when early lovely field morning. And we want to say thank you. So thank you so much to Friends of Frontenac for this opportunity to present and to hear your input. And thank you to my supervisor, Dr. Ryan Danby, my lab, all my resources at Queens and my contacts at Parks Canada. I really appreciate this opportunity. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Michelle. And most interesting presentation. We, we look forward to, to seeing how the research uh, will, will work out. It's, uh, yes, uh, me too, to thank you. Fascinating program, so thank you. Just perhaps um, if people are okay, we have time for some questions, if anybody has any. Just check the chat. Um, no questions in there yet. Okay. Oh, right. Uh, I don't see if there's any hands here. Okay. Well, th thank you very, very much. Yes. There's no hands um, either. Yeah. Was that, that was that deer in, in front of Mac Park or was it? Uh... Oh, sorry. Somebody has a quick question. Oh, yep. Um, I just have a quick question about uh, the aerial images you used at the beginning of your presentation. Yes. Um, I've seen uh, several of these before um, handed down through family members, the ones from the 20s and it was the 60s, the other one, correct? The black and yes. white? Yes. Um, do you have an online link as to where you could get a high resolution version of these photos? Unfortunately, I don't have a link. These photos were provided to me uh, through Queens, um, but I think there are some online libraries that have uh, shared some of their aer aerial imagery through there. And I'm happy to look into that and send you some links. That'd be great. Um, did, uh, it, were these photos uh, taken by Queens or do we so know the they, history? They weren't taken by Queens, but Queens um, bought access to them. And uh, some, some are available online and some of them we had to purchase. Um, but so they're just through online libraries, but if there are any, any online versions, I'm happy to send those to you. That would be great. And lastly, are they, um, I, I can see that uh, in your presentation, they're pixelated, of course, because you want a lower resolution for the presentation, but are they decently high resolution, uh, the ones that have been scanned and are online? Yeah, so for the most part, um, they're, they're great and I'm able to, to you know, make out a lot of the features and um, of course, referencing it to contemporary imagery is really helpful um, to see what features I can use as landmarks or and see what how the landmarks have changed over time, gotten smaller, changed in shape, things like that. Um, but of course, the older imagery we get, uh, it's the quality uh, worsens. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's not as it's not as clear as the contemporary imagery, but definitely still very applicable and useful for my work. It's, it's quite remarkable that there are these photos from the 20s, first of all, 
Yes, absolutely. It's, it's really quite cool. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Look at all these images and, you know, finding all the puzzle pieces and stitching them together to create this, this view of the Frontenac Arts region. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Well, thank you. I, I applaud your research. Thank you so much. Good luck. Thank you. It, Rita has a question for you. Oh, yes. Hi, Michelle. Nice to see you. I just wanted to ask about the five line skinks that you mentioned would exist in Granite Barrens, uh, hopefully. Have you found any in your studies in, at the Queensfield Station or anywhere? Yeah, you know, I was really hoping to see some while I was out doing my field work last summer. And unfortunately, I hadn't. Um, I don't know why exactly um, it might be because of the time period um, unfortunately due to uh, COVID and all the postponing of fieldwork projects I was only able to start my fieldwork uh, mid early August um, so I'm not sure if they would have been there maybe earlier on in the right. spring or right. summer but no unfortunately I didn't see any Okay, but that's something we should look for if we're out and about and report them, uh, because those would be quite rare, right? Yeah, I mean, it's nice to be mindful of them and, and you know, be aware of wh where they are. So for sure, yeah. yeah. Okay, well, thanks so much. I appreciate it, your talk. Thank, thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, are there any, any further questions? No, there's no hands and no questions in the chat box. Okay. Right out. In which case, um, uh, oh, wait, okay. wait, wait. There's an, a hand. Uh, Holly has a question for uh, Michelle. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm um, sorry. Hi. 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 Michelle. <laughs> Thank you for your, your presentation. Um, this might be an annoying question, but I'm just curious what you think about, um, like, why should we be interested in preserving these uh, granite barrens if they're just um, kind of naturally changing anyway as a part of succession, like, because they're kind of uh, left over from the Ice Age? I'm just wondering what's your thoughts on, like, why is it important to conserve them? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I mean, I think there's always some extent to landscape change, natural landscape change. Um, but when it's accelerated to a certain extent due to human activities, I think that's a point where we should really start to right. investigate and understand our actions and how we're influencing these barrens. And so if you know so many threatened and rare species like to inhabit them, we should make sure that they're conserved for a long time and and you know, uh, be mindful of how any human activity is, is sort of altering their mm -hmm. conservation and preservation. Okay, hey, great answer, thanks. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much again, Holly. And, and uh, I'll just share the screen with one final slide. Thank you. Thanks again for a so most, most interesting talk. And I hope we look forward next year when you may be able to present again on some of the conclusions of the study. That, yes, that looking forward to okay. it. Great, thank you, yes. Thanks then. Okay, um, I just said a, yeah, I can, sorry. Uh, oh wait, any thoughts on whether the fires were natural or controlled burn? Tim is asking if any thoughts on whether the fires were natural or controlled burn? Yes, so it was definitely a combination of both. There were um, lots of fires caused uh, by humans in uh, the 50s and um, that was in the Frontenac Arts region, but also um, around some other rock barrens, not necessarily granite, but around some other rock barrens. And um, a lot of burns were happening um, for clear cutting. And uh, also because interestingly enough, uh, a lot of these fires were really helpful for blueberry production. So blueberries have these really shallow root systems. They were able to thrive on barrens and so once people realized that um, a lot of the nutrients caused from 
you know, after the fires um, helped blueberry production, uh, you know, people started to increase the amount of fires uh, to try and promote blueberry growth and production. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> right. I think that's it. Is that okay? So many thanks again, Michelle. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Anne. thanks, and thank you, everybody. I, I just have one final slide I was going to put up. Um, oh. May I have to stop sharing? Uh, okay. Uh, can I do that now? Sorry. Thank you. Is she, is she, share screen, is it? Yeah. Sorry. I was just going to uh, put a, a concluding slide. So. Say thank you to everybody. Um, and sorry. Yeah, so just wanted to say thank you again and everybody. First to our speakers, um, Rob Alvo, John and Kathy Gray, and Michelle Gowen for, for, for your presentation uh, or presentations. Again, it's been, I think, a, a most informative um, and uh, providing a great background information about the park. So thank you again for all of your effort in preparing presentations and providing them today. And thank you to participants um, again.